to everyone who just finished watching the film Minari, and to those of you watching us on YouTube, welcome and thank you for joining us online. My name is Jeffrey Nudin, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop, a national literary nonprofit dedicated to publishing, incubating, and amplifying work by Asian and Asian diasporic writers and artists. Since our founding in 1991, we've provided a countercultural literary space that operates at the intersections of migration, race, and social justice. We are so honored to partner with our friends at A24 to celebrate Korean American Day and to present this screening of Minari, a film that tells a uniquely beautiful story about what it means to find and create a place called home. At the time that we're recording this, we have just come off a week filled with unrest and terror. A week that was preceded by a year filled with loss and tragedy. But it is in our most challenging moments that we at the workshop look to the emissaries of our times, our storytellers, to provide bombs for our soul. And Minari is a film that does just that, telling a very specific story about the Korean American experience but at the same time, embodying so many of the ties that bind us together, love, loss, and hope. For this post-screening discussion, I'm thrilled to introduce Lee Isaac Chung, a director, screenwriter, and the visionary behind Minari. He'll be joined by Min Jin Lee, author of the novels Free Food for Millionaires and Pachinko, which was nominated for, actually a finalist for, um, the National Book Award in 2017. Thank you all again for joining us and thank you Isaac and Min for being here tonight. Over to the two of you. Jeffrey, thanks so much for everything that you've done for the Asian American Writers Workshop. It is an organization that I care about intensely. It is a place that I feel like was a crib of my own and I took classes there when I was a baby writer and it, this is a community that I hold very dear in my heart because I think that as Asian American writers, we are a growing and thriving and flourishing community and we really just love each other. So here's some love for Isaac Chung, who is an incredible writer. So I'm so happy to be in a conversation with him today after seeing his beautiful film. Hey, Isaac, how are you? I'm doing great, man. This is a real treat and honor for me to be talking to you. Uh, I'm such a fan. So thank you so much. Wow. See, look, look at all this mutual love. It's so good. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, dude, I, I wanted to sort of think about because we don't have a whole lot of time and I know you've had lots of talk back. So there are lots of conversations with you in all different formats, but I wanted to make this sort of a home kind of organization in terms of our conversation of like what it was sure. like for you to be a writer and what it's like for you to think about storytelling and in terms of Minari as well as your genesis. So if I could, if you would humor me and humor us by telling us a little bit about your background. I know that you were born in Denver, you are American born, and then you also grew up mostly in Lincoln, Arkansas. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, it, I, I kind of grew up in a, in a place where um, like 10% of the people graduating from my class went on to college. Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really an academic, center, uh, but it was a good community. Um, but I, I was reflecting on this. I really enjoyed writing when I was in high school, um, but um, I never thought that it'd be something that I would ever do. Uh, it was just something that I enjoyed. And uh, when I got to college um, I, over at Yale, I suddenly was, uh, I, I came up against realizing how much my education had not prepared me for, for that. And, and my writing felt suddenly so elementary and, and so, so bad, frankly. Uh, and um, I just immediately just assumed, okay, I'm not really a writer. And I went into the sciences, uh, studied biology. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year that I started to uh, dabble again in, in the arts and realize that I have a real passion for it. So what was um, that first dabbling in the arts in college? I mean, you and I both went to Yale, but I'm, I'm about a hundred years older than you are, but. <laughs> and no, no, you are not. <laughs> no, I just look incredibly <laughs> I <did> young. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
you know, uh, there was the requirement to take group one classes, which means like taking the arts or languages. Yeah, so you're a group, you're a group four guy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All sciences are, are heavily into the sciences. And I needed one final requirement in the in group one, and I wanted to just do an art class. Um, so I took this class. I, uh, I, I approached Michael Romer. I still remember him. He's such a great professor. He was teaching video art. And uh, it's normally a class for upper level art students. But um, he just found it interesting that this science guy came and wanted to take his class. And he told me, I'm going to take a chance with you. And uh, I, I still remember a lot of art students like groaning and they couldn't believe that he had let me in uh, at the expense of letting any one of them in. But, but that class did it for me. I just fell in love with uh, doing these experimental videos every week and um, talking about them. I had never done anything like that. Um, and I started watching different types of movies to get ideas and I fell in love really. And then you decided to become a paralegal, I believe, right? Wasn't that your next gig? <laughs> I did, what I'm, I'm going to out you for this because I just think yeah, it's kind of a fun we, story. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. Uh, so I, I applied to all these film schools my senior year and I didn't get into a single one. Right, because, right. Because yeah, they're idiots. They're idiots. Yeah. Well, you know, they, they, they wanted to see whether or not I was, I mean, they, they felt like I did not exhibit a real passion for it because mm. I had only taken a class at the very end. So, okay. Uh, my professor said, maybe you should take a year to just make a short film and try to find some work. I couldn't find any work in the film industry. Um, and I just hit up a friend and asked, um, do you know of a place where I might be able to get a job? And they said, well, here's this asbestos litigation law firm and they're looking for paralegals. <laughs> so that's what I did. I was a paralegal writing all these letters and uh, yeah. It, it well, you're probably really what defending as asbestos companies, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Isaac Chung has been busted for. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, I, I, it's really you're funny that you say it. that, right? No, because when you're 20, 21, and you're trying to get a gig. And if you get hired by a law firm, most likely you're fighting for the other side. <laughs> so that's cool that you did that for a year. And you said, um, I still want to make movies. And how did, what did you do? Um, well, the good thing is that working in that office, they let me use that office for, uh, for a movie shoot. So I was able oh, to film this, okay. <laughs> this thing and, and use that place. And uh, that's, uh, after that, I got into three film schools, so at least I had uh, an opportunity, and I picked uh, the University of Utah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It, it, it felt nice, um, and it I went worked to out. Utah. It was okay, right? It, it worked out. <laughs> In the end, it, it was really tough, though. I, I felt like you know I was getting rejected from all the big ones, so I, I just wondered if that meant um, you know I'm, I'm off to a bad start. Um, and obviously going to Salt Lake City, Utah, doesn't feel like you're going to a, a major production hub. So you feel like you're going away from the industry in a sense. Right. Um, Did you get yeah. to intern at Sundance? I, I didn't, but I went to the festival. Right. Almost religiously. Yeah. Every year. Right. Yeah. What was that like to go to the festival as a baby filmmaker or wannabe and then eventually to win those big prizes? It, it felt, uh. Um, yeah, that's the element you're, you're picking up on that was, was really, it felt, felt redemptive in a way, because, mm. because you do feel when you're, when you're young and going there, you feel like a nobody. Um, so there, there is that element where, um, you know what it was like on the other side and to feel that there's such a mountain to try to get to the festival and to actually have a film there. Um, so it, it, it felt uh, like, yeah, I'd, I'd been on quite a long journey to get back to the same place. That's really terrific. So you went to film school when you're 22. And when you were mm -hmm. in film school, what was that like? Um, it was, I was the only grad student. So they, uh, oh. of my class, so they would only take one or two grad students. Um, and then they expect you to teach classes for undergrads. Oh um, my gosh. So that's kind of the way that it's set up. And how um, was that? Because at that point you hadn't taken any film classes. I didn't know. I didn't know. But anything. you were the TA. Yeah, exactly. That is deep. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I have honestly said things in section that I would be appalled about now. You know, the <laughs> fact that these things came out of my mouth to these students who are paying for an education. Um, 
Uh, the, but the good thing for me was that it meant that the school was free. I didn't have to pay anything because I was doing this. Uh, that, so that arrangement was great. And it gave me teaching um, experience, which, which helped me get work later. So, so, you know, this is an important question for our community because these are very young writers who are trying to write in different formats and trying to make art. And we, many of us come from communities that are where the idea of making art is so anathema and terrifying yeah. for the families. Not because I think the families are bad, but just because it's a very unstable life as you and I know. And mm -hmm. I was just curious, when you were at film school, did you feel like, oh, this is the right thing? Like, I, I this is what I want to do. And what did you feel about that? Um, I'm Honestly, I did it because I felt I had no choice that mm -hmm. if if I didn't do it, it would be hard for me to have the time to focus on the craft and to study um, without having a, an excuse to tell my parents. In other words, I, I needed to be able to say, look, this degree will help me get teaching work. Um, I'm studying, I'm in graduate school. Um, even if the subject is something they didn't agree with, at least they could wrap their heads around that and right. not bother me for three years as I really you know, tried to spend that time to learn. Do you recommend yeah. people that they go to film school? Um, I, I, I do recommend it to people who need that time and that dedicated time to study the craft and to make things, uh, especially for, I, I've recommended a lot to Asian American uh, young people whose parents are similar to the way my parents were. Um, cause, cause I noticed it helped me to, uh, to not have that pressure on me. Um, yeah, I don't know what your, your experience must've been like, I know you, you dealt with this as well because you were, you were studying later. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I'm asking this question in particular because I get this question so much and I was wondering what you mm. thought because you did take the path, but I think what you did, but I was incredibly smart is to not have debt. So because uh, yeah, it was yeah. free, that's really smart. I think that when I hear about people who went to film school or get an MFA in fiction, very often yeah. they are a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars in debt, and that's yeah. a lot of money. That's a lot to start an art career because very often it. I mean, it's more likely than not people are not going to get a return on their equity. <laughs> right, so right. I, I worry about that, but I think what you did was really smart because it gave you the time, and then also you don't have the debt. And then it gave you a little bit of breathing space to try to learn something. Right. That's why I, I, I imagine it was very difficult for you to explain to your parents or even, I don't know if you dealt with that at all. You know, because you were studying on your own in a way. Yeah. Well, I went to law school. So mm -hmm. I don't want you to feel bad in any way whatsoever about being a TA and not knowing anything about film because <laughs> I teach at a college now. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I don't have an English degree. I went to a law school and I don't have an MFA, but I am in the English department at Amherst College. So. <laughs> and you have every right to be there, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, I, I think that this whole idea of this autodidact, I take that quite seriously. And I took a lot of really mm. inexpensive classes at community centers. So I feel perfectly good about what I do, but it's very funny because you could go in a very traditional way. And I think that there's a real temptation when you want to be an artist to take this path of getting the right degree, like an English degree. And you have a bio degree, right? Yeah, right. You have a history degree. And and then uh, you also have the, the next path of, oh, I'm going to get a master's and I'll get a PhD and then I'll teach. Yeah. And then you know, of course, in Korean, like to get the paksa, to get the PhD, that's like a big deal. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> um, and then hopefully you become an artist. But I think that path is an extraordinarily expensive and risky one for the average mm -hmm. middle class person. So I always right. worry about the kids. So I think being a yeah. paralegal was probably a very good idea. <laughs> well, it, I, I like that. I've, I feel like I've had some life experience doing other things, if that makes sense and mm -hmm. studying other things. And um, that's something I worry about with young people who are in film from the very beginning, from undergrad, from freshman year. You know, I, I feel like you have to be outside of the world, that world and live life and then draw from that life rather than let your life become the film and, and that practice. Yeah, and then I always worry about kids who wanna be, um, to find a career as an artist because I don't think 
being an artist is a career. I think that it's a weird byproduct of making art. If you're lucky, you get to yeah, have yeah, some sort of support agree. financially. But I think for the most part, making art cannot really be approached. Like the thing that I get all the time is networking. And I'm always like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What does it have to do with making art? But I think that's the way you have a capitalist economy sort of teaching young people and I kind of have to yeah. make them stop saying stuff like, oh, can I pick your brain? Can I network with you? And I'm always like, ew, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't yeah. say that. But, I'm glad um, you say that. Yeah, I, I hear that all the time as well, yeah. I know, and, and I, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's a, it's a matter of, I think, um, they're told that's what they're supposed to do. But I kind of think what's really much more important is that you have to feel like there's nothing else I can do but this thing. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who always gives the advice to people, don't do it. And then, right. yeah. And then if they're really meant to do it, they're going to do it. Anyway, this is what he says. So do you think that's a really good test to say, don't do it? I don't know. Uh, recently, I was starting to think I shouldn't say that because it's so discouraging. Um, so I, I, I have honestly no idea. And, and I don't know, everybody's individual journey is going to be so different into this thing that um, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to even feel like you can give advice that amounts to life advice in that way. I, I don't even know. I don't yeah. know how you, I'd be curious how you handle all those questions. Oh, I just tell people, if you like reading and writing and you feel like that's what you have to do, no, I can't stop you. Mm, yeah. No one can stop you. Right. And also you won't care if it doesn't work out. You won't care in the same way that if you were just trying to get recognition, you would be right. devastated every single day. Right, right. Because no recognition is actually enough. There'll always be things that you can't get. And yeah. I'm sure even Bong Joon-ho is probably thinking like, oh, you know, <laughs> I right. didn't get that. <laughs> so, and I kind of, I heard the wonderful conversation that he had with you. And then I also heard the conversation that you had at the Korea Society. And I think for this audience in particular, you guys might really enjoy those conversations with Isaac as well, because we won't be able to cover everything today in the, what is it, 20 minutes that we have left. So you go to film school and then tell us about your first job and as a filmmaker or your first project as a filmmaker if it wasn't necessarily a job? Um, so my, my wife and I, I got married after uh, going to film school. Um, is she actually, also a filmmaker? No, she is. A, a, she's a therapist, which is really nice in the family to have. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call her after this talk. I had <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, we moved to New York and the first job that I was able to get, I, I still remember I applied to like 80 jobs. And the only thing that I could get was um, up in this town that's like an hour north. I, I'd have to take uh, the, the train, um, Mount Kisco. It's, I don't know how long, yeah, if, if you've ever been there, but. I have, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's they would make spot, yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they'd make educational videos and each, each video has a budget of around thirty thousand oh. dollars, and um, they're, they're videos that uh, teachers essentially show their kids when they don't want to plan plan something for that day. Um, the qu the quality was you know not, not that great. They're not in business anymore, um, but I was a producer of these videos, um, so oh. it, yeah, hiring different people to come in to work on crew, and then also getting all the actors. Um, we had a director who's directing the videos. Um, so that was the first work. And uh, pay was not that great, but it was it was a start with something. That's um, amazing. So right now we could technically go on eBay and find the early Isaac Chung <laughs> films. <laughs> <laughs> the bootleg education editions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so um tell us i shouldn't that. have said anything now no no, no i think it's really good and as a matter of fact i think it's a really helpful thing for people who are starting out to understand yeah. that it isn't like you were thinking and you're wearing a black sweater and a beret and like you know smoking a cigarette and figuring out how to write movies i think very often yeah. people have this very romantic idea when in fact most uh writers and filmmakers that i know are really really struggling to try to figure something out so I think Justin yeah. Lin uh, made his first film, uh, what is it, like on credit cards and his parents had to help him. And right. It was really hard. So 
I think it's really yeah. helpful to know that you're making educational videos. Excellent. Now, can we talk about writing in terms of, let's say, just Minari? Because that is what your fourth fiction film, right? Your fourth feature. Yeah, that's right. And then you also have a documentary. So can you talk about the write, uh, the notes process and what it was like, let's say, when you wrote your first film and then you went to your, like, it went from um, Munyu uh, Rangabo to Lucky Life mm -hmm. to Abigail Harm and then now it's Minari. And how are the processes the same and different in terms of your writing, your notes process, and then also eventually execution? Um, they changed a great deal. The, the first three films I made, I really loved filmmakers who would do a lot of improvisation. Uh, people like Wong Kar Wai was, was a huge influence. Ho Shao Shen, uh, the, these filmmakers who during production, they would try to capture the film in a way. Terrence Malick does that sort of thing. Um, and I, I worked with a dear friend of mine, Sam Anderson, and we would craft together just a very basic script. And often it's just an outline, like the one I shot in Rwanda, that was about like a nine or 10 page document. Um, and then during the course of production is when we would flesh things out. And that came through the collaboration with actors, trying to capture moments. Um, and I, I felt after Abigail Harm, I started to see the limitations of that process. And um, more and more, I felt it wasn't me in a way. I, I, mm -hmm. I wanted more control. Um, and I'd always assume losing that control is healthy. And, and of course it can be, but um, I just felt like my voice was getting lost in the process. And I wanted to uh, just sit down with, with pen and paper really, uh, with my laptop, I, I should be honest and uh, learn how to write a script and, and to do it to the point in which I would be able to say to an actor, just please do the lines and, and <laughs> you know, and, and uh, that I would have that, that amount of confidence in what I'd written. Um, and I felt like it was important for me to learn that. So I, I spent a lot of time between Abigail Harm and Minari in learning how to write. So I, I, I was, uh, I, I've mentioned to you before, I, I, I was breaking apart films, um, the films that I thought were incredibly written and uh, just going line by line, how did they, how did they do this? And, and just analyzing uh, minute by minute. Um, and I, I wrote some scripts that weren't working. And, um, but along the way, I was figuring things out. Why wasn't this working? You know, what is it that, that does work? Um, and then finally in 2018, uh, I got to Minari and then it just felt like I understood more of what I need to do with all the storylines of the family members and the relationships and the emotional turning points and then how to tie in theme. And um, I was glad that I waited for this most personal film up to like at that point after I had kind of figured things out a little more. Yeah, there's um, been a lot of discussion about how this being a personal film and how it, it is autobiographical and that it's a very personal story and all those things are true and there's a lot of discussion of that out there already in the ether and I was mm -hmm. just curious the thing that I was interested with you with, is as an American thinker about sociology and economics and the real world of what an artist is doing and what you wanted to say can you tell me what you think about what's going on in the midwest especially as it relates to today uh what the, the plight of the farmer the plight of the American farmer, which is something that I think American thinkers have been thinking about since, you know, really the 18th century until now. And you have young Jacob and his family who are pioneers. And I was just curious, what do you want to say about that? Yeah, that um, I'm glad you asked that. that. That was one of the things that I thought about a lot um, as I was approaching the story, because um, as I was remembering the era in which we started farming, that was um, in the early 80s, um, there was a farm crisis that was happening and there were all, all sorts of geopolitical reasons for that. Um, but what that meant on the ground for actual farmers is that land prices were going up mm -hmm. and uh, people, were, people had taken out all these loans and their farms were collapsing because they weren't able to, to pay back. The, the price of, of produce and everything was dropping. Um, and Lo and behold, we, we entered farming right around that time. And it, it, was, it was a difficult thing for us. And I noticed uh, uh, that somehow that was happening again in the US 
Um, and it wasn't being talked about. Like there was a rise of, of suicides of farmers and mm. um, uh, of, of various things. And, and yet farmers were being used in a very political way. Right. Yeah, to, to forward certain agendas and things like that. But the actual life and the actual humanity of them and what that life is like um, was something that I wanted to return to as a storyteller. And to do that with... Um, with this Korean immigrant family, it, with immigrants who are also highly politicized and, and used and, and and things like that, and, and in a way find some common ground there. Well, in the cities, we wouldn't have any produce unless immigrants were picking those crops. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. We, we're so dependent on, on them. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's interesting because people keep thinking that this is a fish out of water story, but actually immigrants have been part of American farming for a very, very long time. And mm -hmm. I was really glad to see that you are taking this on. Can you speak a little bit about the metaphor of Minari? Um, sure. It, the reason for including it originated because of very personal reasons, because my grandmother had planted it in a creek at the bottom of our, our farm. Uh, and when, when it came time for us to kind of close the farm down, uh, one thing that my parents mentioned was uh, the only thing that seemed to really grow well on our farm was Minari. And uh, I, I just thought there's something so poetic about that. And uh, my, my memory of going down there with my grandmother um, informs that poetry, but also the, the idea that uh, it's something that was growing without effort, whereas everything that we were going through on the farmland itself was done with so much effort that was uh, disappointing us often, um, but but here was my grandmother's way of doing things that was so different and yet um, yielding this in incredible crop. Um, so I, I knew that I wanted to have that peppered throughout the story and for it to end with a patch of minari. Um, and and later on, I learned that the plant itself it's something that you let die in the first planting and then you harvest the second growth of it mm -hmm. and. I just thought, wow, that as a metaphor, that's very interesting as well. But I hadn't planned that. It just it just happened to be there. Already. No, actually, your subconscious is actually a genius. I, Isaac, you want to give it the credit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I knew that all along. <laughs> <laughs> no, talk to me about the adaptive nature, because I think that that to me was really interesting about the hardiness of Minari and also the adaptive quality of it. And then I was wondering if you intended that mm. you were saying Americans were this way or immigrants were this way. Are we the Minari of um, America? Um, yeah, it, it does adapt very, um, it, it's very robust as a plant. And not only does it get planted in like the worst soils, it, it ends up purifying that soil. It ends up cleaning it and cleaning the water. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that does speak to, to us as immigrants and um, to uh, many Americans who, who see themselves as immigrants. Um, and at the same time, I felt there's a metaphor for it uh, that goes beyond like a direct correlation with something, but that it, it speaks to something inexpressible and emotional. And um, I would hope it, it has something to do with love itself. And um, I, uh, for instance, I still don't know why it has to be Minari that the film ends on, but it does. Like that's, that's just the way I feel. Right. Um, I don't know I if actually, that makes sense. No, actually I thought that that is the accurate way. And that's not a spoiler for us to say that it is ending there because I think whether you see Minari as the immigrant or whether you can even say art, art is the Minari of our lives because it can mm. be clarifying. It is really adaptive and actually it, it flourishes if you let it. And sometimes it's an accident. So I thought that all those things, that, yeah. all those things really work beautifully in your film. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk to you about faith because I noticed that it's not really covered in the way um, the film is covered in, in the press and also in the interviews. And I was wondering about the character Paul and his relationship mm -hmm. with Jacob, because Paul is such a, 
a vibrant and vital and important figure, this guy who is the, who almost seems a bit mad, right? And he carries yeah. this cross and he is bullied. And yet he's like this really faithful attendant to Jacob. And he and Jacob have this really interesting kind of friendship, you know, and a working relationship. Yeah. I mean, Jacob can't do it without Paul. Paul needs this job. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you can speak about what motivated you to write that story. Um, I mean, he, he does originate from someone who was a dear friend of ours. So mm. th there is that basis. Um, but I've always loved stories where there, I, I kind of did this Munir Angabo as well, where there is a character who is kind of seen as the fool, but really that person holds much of the wisdom that, mm -hmm. that, the, that people need. Um, and I wanted to do that with, with him because I, I do remember this gentleman from um, our lives and the way that he was shunned, um, but I still go back to him. He, he would call himself a fool. Uh, I still go back to him and think about him as um, some, I don't know, someone I, I want to be more like, that, that m myself, I, I want to be more like that. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it was so fun to, to work with him as well uh, in all of those scenes. and. Uh, I, I do think on a religious level, you know, he does speak to my view of, of uh, certain religious ideals. Um, you know, like if, if it's, um, well, if we're going to talk about the Christian faith, um, which is, it, it is what I grew up in. Um, I did too. My grandfather's a minister. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, I felt as though he offers a, more of a glimpse into what that identity means. Um, even though he has this uh, crazy side to him and it's being expressed in this, in this way that uh, we would all laugh at, um, at the heart of it, there's, there's a servanthood and there's a, a love and there's a, uh, a lack of self-seriousness. And um, yeah, there's, there's just something about it that I personally gravitate to in, in Christianity. Yeah, I really loved it so much. And I I loved that relationship. I love the character that Will Pat Patton delivers. It's so beautiful. Like, I mean, obviously the knockout per performances by Steven Yeun and um, the characters, um, Monica, and I mean, adorable, adorable David. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that Alan Kim, I think? Um, yeah, Alan. Yeah, absolutely Alan terrific. And Sunja is really terrific too. Everybody's amazing. But I was really struck by that sort of, true aspect of real American life. I think people don't want to talk about the Christian aspects of rural communities. And I thought to me, that's what made Minati so incredibly distinctively American. And it's found in the tradition of American literature. It's found in the tradition of American communities to have yeah. the church be so centered. And I thought yeah. that the Paul character was terrific. And I'm really glad to hear that you like that character of the innocent and the fool and the faithful. Yeah, definitely. And that, that picture of them at a table together, that, mm -hmm. that to me was really a key for the whole film. Um, you know, sharing that meal together, that kind of communion um, in which it's a different image from seeing a family go to a church. You know, it's, it's the reverse. You, church kind of descends on them at that moment um and, right yeah well i think that there are two sections in church which i think are very accurate so you have the children kind of being odd to each other and it looks like it's sort of teasing and meanness and at the same time it, you know as children you're kind of thinking yeah so what my name is this and, and what are you going to do about it and then at the same time you have that table when they're sharing the meal it's also quite mm -hmm. beautiful and open. And for me, that is really the best part about America is this kind of accidental and beautiful, graceful friendship. So- Oh, for sure, yeah. That was so well represented. Um, I was just curious that if you could look back on young Isaac, who's thinking about art and how exciting it is as a 21 <laughs> year old boy in New Haven and before yeah. he embarks on a legal life. And then of course, film school, what do you think that you would tell him? Because I think that those who are watching this right now are probably thinking, oh gosh, like, can I do what Isaac Chung does? <laughs> I mean, me personally, I wouldn't have said anything to, to myself because I needed to go through that journey and I don't regret any minute of it. You know, I have, I, 
I have an incredible family and I, I always imagine if, if I changed any one thing that in my life, I might not have them, you know, so I, I just don't have any regrets. That whole journey informed who I am today and the art itself. Um, and if, if I was going to give advice though to someone else, I mean, maybe I would say, don't, don't fear that journey. Um, it's, it's a necessary thing and uh, all the, and all the best to you on that journey. It's, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's life. So for those of you guys who want to know more about Isaac, I really did enjoy the conversation that he had um, at the Korea Society podcast, as well as his conversation with Bong Joon-ho. And I think that's in Variety, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That so, was incredible. I, I was, I, it's similar to now, actually. I was, I was I'm such a fan. But I don't know. <laughs> trying to keep up here. You're very sweet. Actually, I had dinner with him when Parasite first came out with oh, Mickey cool. Lee. And I just kind of sat there going like, you are amazing. <laughs> and he was yeah. so lovely. And I just like thought, oh, what's what I find really exciting about people who are making things is that we can all just kind of be nerds around each other because we really want to just keep making more things. And everything yeah. else seems to be nonsense. But anyway, and I hope that on that note, um, please support the Asian American Writers Workshop. We do the work of growing writers, growing art, and also growing our voices and our stories. And Isaac, thank you so much for hanging oh, out. Thank you us. so much. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Okay.